our guest today, with whom we're going to have a, a, what I think is going to be a wonderful and meaningful conversation. Um, our guest is the chief operating officer of Combs Enterprises, which is the business empire of Sean Diddy Combs. He's a graduate of Howard University. He's a graduate of Harvard Business School. He is also a pilgrim parent, and he serves on the pilgrim governing board. Will you help me, please, in welcoming Tarek Brooks. Have a seat, my friend. So until the time that I was asked to do this conversation, I did not know of you. We have spoken on the phone a couple of times. We just met this morning. But if you go to the uh, Combs Enterprises website, there is this picture of Tarek with this beaming smile. And the smile says, all of life has been wonderful. I have been blessed. I have never had any challenges. There have been no <laughs> problems in my life. And of course, I know that no one actually lives in that world. So it makes me first want to ask you to think back over your very successful career and think back to the toughest problem you ever had to face. Great. Well, thank, thank you for having me. Thank everyone for having me. Um, so when I think back to the toughest challenge I've ever had, it was back uh, a little over 10 years ago. Um, at the time, I was uh, working in the Caribbean, uh, enjoying life and building businesses. And I received a call from the gentleman I worked for. Uh, his name is Bob Johnson, a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, and he had just at the Clinton Global Initiative met the president of Liberia, uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, and he made a promise to her that he would build her a hotel uh, in our country, which was just out of civil war. Uh, Bob called me and said, I made this promise, and this hotel is now behind schedule and over budget. Can you go fix it? <laughs> <laughs> so that call was on uh, December 31st, and by January 5th, I had moved to a country that was fresh out of civil war to you know, get a seemingly impossible task built, and that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my, my career. And I know that on your Twitter feed, you describe yourself as an international man of leisure, <laughs> um, which I hear the job is easy, but the hours are long. <laughs> um, and so I take it that once you accepted this challenge from him, the leisure stopped. Uh, what was the first, when you first, had you been to Liberia before? No, I, I, had not, I had not been to Liberia before. The only thing I knew about Liberia at the time was it was the home of one of the most gruesome civil wars in recent history. Uh, so I knew I was walking into um, something that was going to be a bit dangerous, a bit scary, and, and filled with a whole lot of uncertainty. Okay, so when you first got there, what's the first thing you assessed <clears throat> in figuring out how you were going to accomplish this goal? Yep, so I landed into a country that had absolutely no electrical grid, absolutely no army or police force. There were only a contingent of um, UN peacekeepers there to keep the country from kind of trickling back into civil war. Uh, and the, the, the staff that I had was, you know, about 350 to 400 young men who, just a couple years older, were 14 to 16 year old children soldiers. Um, these were young boys who were given drugs and guns and tasked with doing some of the most horrible things that uh, humans can do to one another. Uh, and these were the people that I had to rely on to help get this hotel built. So when you got there and you realized, here were the people I was going to be working with, then how did you establish a rapport with them? Yep, so I think the first thing I had to do was bridge the gap. I, I needed for them to be able to see me as one of them. I think the, the, the thing that motivated me to go over there is I understood how significant this hotel would be in changing the trajectory of the country. And so I wanted them to understand that I was there to be a part and to be their teammate. And so I first had to gain their trust. Um, and you know, interestingly, you know, food is a thing that unites. And so mm -hmm. one of the first things I did was eat with the people. And in Liberian culture, it is customary to have a group of people around one big bowl filled with mm -hmm. rice and vegetables mm -hmm. and meat. Mm -hmm and you kind of eat with your hands and eat together. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that, you know, some of the kind of 
American expats that would have helped me were afraid to do because they were afraid of getting what is commonly known as Liberian belly, which <laughs> save everybody the details of, but it's not a pleasant experience. I think we understand <laughs> what you mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so just by that simple gesture of kind of humbling myself to eat as they ate and commune how they commune, we, build, we started to build a level of trust. And you also had, there was an additional deadline that you had to meet? Absolutely. So the, the, the deadline for this hotel was to be able to have it built to host an international symposium. So the first visitors on this hotel property were going to be heads of state from all around the world that were being hosted uh, by the president. You know, so missing this deadline would have been a tremendous failure. And so um, it was uh, a very important thing that I very quickly got on the ground and assessed how likely we were to succeed. And what I, what I determined right away was that we were not doing things the way we were doing it on a path to, to success. Okay, so as you're figuring out, you've got, here are your workers, here's your deadline. Um, what was the hardest ask you had to make of your workers? Yeah, so um, after going through the experience they went through, um, much of the Liberian people found solace in their religion and their spirituality and for them, you know, doing anything other than going to church on Sunday was a huge no-no. Um, I realized, figuring out what it took to get this project done, that unfortunately I was going to have to ask these men to work on their Sundays, which was a huge ask. Uh, not to mention the 90 degree heat and 85% humidity that they were working on. These guys were already working six days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, so this was a tremendous ask. And so, you know, on a Friday afternoon, I gathered all of the staff around and helped them understand where we were and helped remind them of the significance of this project. And I made a pact with them. And I said to you, I said, if you guys are willing to give me for the next six to seven weeks, your Sunday, I will not only work this site with you for that entire time, but I will do whatever job you guys decide I should do on that <laughs> particular day. And so for the next you know, seven weeks, you know, I spent my time, 12 to 14 hours a day in the burning sun, digging sewer trenches with old shovels um, alongside men who, you know, some weeks I would lose to malaria or lose to typhoid or poisonous snake bites, all these things every week. And so I was in there in the trenches with them and I think that commitment showed them that if I was willing to suffer the worst with them, they should be willing to do it too because I was doing it for them. And as you proceeded, was there one point that was the most bleak, the most discouraging to you? Uh, yep. So, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> there, there, there were, I mean, look, the, 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 I, I could fill our entire time a Liberian story. So, you know, my worst day wasn't the time I spent in a Liberian jail. You know, the worst day wasn't the time when I had, you know, workers kidnapped. The worst day was when the president of the country who is affectionately known as Oma in, in Liberia, which means grandma, came to the site a few weeks out, did an assessment, and in her eyes, she believed there was no way for us to get it done. And so she looked at me in the way that only a grandmother could and let me know that she was disappointed. Didn't say a word, but then turned to our staff and said, you need to start looking for alternative options. And she said this kind of in front of me so I can hear it. And I think that was my darkest day in Liberia, that was a night that was super tough for me because I felt I had let her down, I had let the country down, I had let my boss down. And so that was, that was as painful as it, as, as it got when I was there. And then the next time she came back, was how much later and how were you able to turn it around for her? Yeah. So, um, you know, being a person who doesn't give up easy, you know, I kind of live by the adage that, you know, once you find yourself in hell, keep going. <laughs> And so, and so, you know, I, don't you know, stop in hell. <laughs> I'm going to remember that. <laughs> yeah, just keep going. And so, continue to work, continue to dive deep. You know, the team did a tremendous job, and just a couple weeks later, we were significantly farther along. And in a way that, if you came to visit the site, you would see that. And so, Oma comes back to the site, and she looks around. And you know, very few times in life, I'm nervous, but I'm I'm there, nervous to see how she's going to react. She looks at me with a little bit of a squint in her eye then turns back to her aide and says, so tell me exactly where the lunch is gonna be again. <laughs> <laughs> and that for me was, was redemption from that situation because at that point I knew she realized we could get it done. 
she could host this event that would show this country was now open for business to the world in that way. And that, you know, this little part that I played was going to be fundamental to this country rebuilding itself. And so the hotel opened on time. Absolutely. In 2009? In 2009. So, you know, this is the 10 year anniversary, actually. The hotel opened on time. We hosted heads of state from Europe, from other countries in Africa, from Canada. Um, and it was a tremendous success. We built um, relationships with a lot of the companies that were coming to Liberia to figure out if they could do business. So companies in the mining sector and the you know, hospitality sector and in the uh, timberland, and those kinds of things. And so it opened and was, it was a great success. Um, unfortunately, just a few years later, uh, Ebola uh, hit Liberia, which was you know, a, a, a terrible epidemic and actually undid a lot of the great work uh, that, that we had done and that the country had done to kind of rebuild itself. Um, I think the one kind of s silver lining to the whole incident is when Ebola hit, uh, our hotel was effectively ground zero. So for when Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross and other groups came into the country to be able to help, um, their first stop was our hotel to get situated, get organized and go out into the countryside. But you know, unfortunately we lost um, several employees and their families to, to Ebola. Um, but at least this institution that we built played a part in, in really saving the country from further catastrophe. So I would imagine that these days now when you wake up, <laughs> nothing is going to seem like as big of a problem as the one you faced in Liberia. I, 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 no matter absolutely. what Diddy does. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, so when you see that smile, that smile is mostly knowing that you know, when I wake up, I'm not going to face any problems anywhere near as severe as what I, as what I faced over there. So yeah, I always, you know, keep that in perspective. And both of us came to this church to this day in a way, in the same way, in that um, I had a daughter who went to Pilgrim School, and you have two kids who are now in the school, right? Absolutely. My, my, my son, Jazz, is a new third grader. <laughs> and my daughter, Sayla, is uh, in junior kindergarten. Wonderful. Um, and my beautiful wife, Kirsa, keeps it all together, so. <laughs> and I was interested in the three different um, scripture readings that we had before our conversation started. Can you tell us about your kids' names and what the origin of them is? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So um, my son, Jazz, his full name is Jaziel, is an Old Testament name. Um, in the Bible, Jaziel was one of the musicians that played while the Ark of the Covenant was being transported. Uh, and my daughter, Selah, uh, is also an Old Testament name. Her, her name means to have a reflective pause. Um, Jazz also has a Muslim middle name. So his name is Jaziel Amin. So his first name is Hebrew and his second name is Muslim. So he is destined to you know, resolve every conflict in the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> I thought then perhaps you would have called him Jared. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so this follows your parenthood follows a long career, <clears throat> and how does it compare in its challenge? Well, what's interesting is, for me, I think parenthood is actually very similar to the way I approach. Um, my career and all my work. I mean, it, it, is, it is literally a series of experiments, right? Like no parent starts off with all the answers, right? You experiment every day, you see the result of those experiments and then you change and you adapt. And so that's a lot of kind of what I'm trying to do every day with my family and my children is every day I'm taking all the information I have, making the best decision I can and seeing how much of it I get wrong so I can try to do better the next day. Is there, is there one example you can give us of a time maybe where at one point you would have handled it one way, but you've learned how to handle this a different way? Oh, I, I, absolutely. I'm sure my wife will tell you there are plenty of those. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the, 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 the fallacies or mistakes I've made was kind of assuming the approach for me would have been the approach for them. Um, and so, you know, we've had situations where because of my career, we've had to move a time or two. And so my kids have had to be, you know, the new kid in several situations. And there was a particular situation where my son was a new guy and was, you know, working through some issues in, in the environment. So some of the, you know, the kids he kind of found himself the monks weren't, weren't being the nicest at all times. And so um, I immediately went to like, what would have been right for me? 
and what would that approach be? And, and I'm a person who is, I wouldn't say confrontational, but like, okay, if there has to be a little conflict sometimes, that is not the worst thing. Um, my son is much more of a diplomat, and I pushed him to be like me, and the, the, the big fail was, not only did the situation not resolve itself, he didn't want to talk to me about it anymore. Mm. And so I realized, and my wife actually helped me realize that you know, trying to do it the way that's going to work for me isn't necessarily going to be the thing for him. And fortunately, he was able to figure out his own way to resolve this situation and work through it, but you know, through no help of his dad in that particular, <laughs> in that particular situation. And he, he plays lacrosse? He does. Um, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great lacrosse player, and, you know, I'll take a moment and say an incident where it actually did work out the right way. You know, he, he was, when we moved, he was in first grade, and, you know, in, in California, lacrosse is just not as popular as on the East Coast, though the league I signed him up with was a second and third grade league, and so that meant as a young six-year-old, he was at times having to play against kind of nine and sometimes 10-year-old kids who were much bigger than him at that age. And I remember a particular game where um, he was out there against, you know, a guy who had to be a foot and a half bigger than him. And, you know, his team was getting pushed around quite a bit. And at halftime, I went over to him, and I could see he had a couple of tears streaking down under his helmet. I said, Dad, what's wrong? What's going on? And he said, Dad, I'm getting pummeled. <laughs> <laughs> and so in that moment, I had to stop and think about, you know, how I would help him work through this situation in real time. And so, you know, rather than necessarily tell him to kind of suck it up and fight and things that maybe would have worked for me, you know, I kind of stopped and said, like, it's okay. Like, if you're hurt, it's okay to have a, you know, cry sometimes. And I told him, it's like, this is the time where courage matters, right? Courage is not what you do when you're confident and when everything is calm. Courage is what you do when you're afraid, how you deal with that situation and when you're unsure. Um, and so he got himself together and went back on the field and ran around like a crazy person and did what you know, his team needed him to do. So it was one of those situations where you know, I felt like I did actually get it right. Like I gave him what he needed in that time, which was a bit more compassion and empathy and understanding. And that allowed him to find his own strength in that situation and it worked out well. May we all learn such lessons. Um, <laughs> the, um, and you mentioned when you were young that maybe a uh, confrontational way might have worked better. Where did, where did you grow up? And, yep. and, and, what, and what kind of religion was there in the household that you grew up in? Yeah, so I grew up in an interesting situation where my parents, who are both from the Philadelphia area, um, moved to New Jersey when I was very young. And so I would spend my school years, the better part of that, in kind of suburban New Jersey. And then I would spend my summers with my extended family in inner city Philadelphia. And you know, as one can imagine, those are two very, very different situations where people have very different worldviews and very different problems. And so what that enabled me to do from a very young age is learn how to adapt and understand and be sensitive to people in different situations to help me navigate. Um, I also think my, my kind of spiritual grounding in my household was a bit different and unique uh, in that my mother was Christian, uh, my dad was Muslim, and I went to a Catholic school. Um, and so for me, I was kind of forced to be very open-minded and ask more questions um, as I went into different situations and thought about my own spirituality as it evolved. I, I think uh, being forced to be open-minded is one of the greatest lessons that anybody can learn in life. Mm -hmm. And I share some of this with you in that um, I was raised in a household where whenever we moved, my parents would look for the closest Protestant church, and if the people seemed nice, that's where we were going. So we were Lutherans one time, then we're Episcopalians, <laughs> then we're Methodists, then we're Presbyterians. I remember one week we were Christian scientists. That did not stick. <laughs> um, and, 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 but what it gave me, and then I was largely like a lot of um, uh, artists and comedians and people I, I still know and work with, I became an atheist in my young adulthood, and then I had this near-death asthma attack and had this profound sense of God, but not a sense of a specific religion. Mm -hmm. And it made me pursue things in a much more general way, which some people might think makes me into a dilettante, but I actually think it makes for a more profound experience, and that's what I feel also like yep. that you have, that you're not specifically identified with any individual sect of religion, 
And that makes you open to seeing a commonality yeah. of spiritual values and then to be giving that to your children. I, absolutely. I think what I've, what I've strived to uh, find in, in every religion I've come across and any religious person I've come across is the things that are consistent, that are unifying. And like, I, I think at its essence, there, there, there is the notion of a higher power and the notion of love and peace and all these things that are super valuable. And I'm able to kind of separate that from the weakness of humanity, which is that in some cases, just about every religion has been utilized in ways that were inconsistent with the spirit of the way, you know, those that kind of designed them or communicate them intended them. And so, you know, I can, I like to think I can find the best in people and the best in situations and hope that I'm giving that to my children and allowing them to open-mindedly explore, um, you know, spirituality in a way that works for them. Well, you can only find the best in people if you're looking for it. And I love that phrase that Laura used earlier in the service about the school of God. Absolutely. And, and uh, all of that is very interesting to me. I want to uh, 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 go to one last area. Um, this is America, 2019, and you are a black man raising black children mm -hmm. in, in a country that has been systemically uh, unjust and and many are are trying to be better many unfortunately are not how do you as a parent what what um, special challenges are you are there for you as a parent yeah, yeah this is something that my, my wife and I talk about all the time um, my I guess one of the principles I live by in everything I do is to first kind of deal with and accept what reality is Right? And the reality is, you know, as much as, you know, I am a patriotic, country-loving American, I know that my people have systematically been treated unfair, you know, since their arrival here. Um, and one of the things we strive to make sure our children understand is that reality in that situation, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't make them pessimistic and closed and angry. You know, there, there, are, there is a lot to be optimistic about and a lot to be excited about, particularly as their generation views race and people's freedoms and people's differences in a different way from past generations. Um, but I can't have them walk through the world uh, with rose-colored glasses and not understand the real dynamics of things that are still affecting them and us today. And, you know, there's also a, a burden that they, they need to bear based on the fact that they've been fortunate to be blessed into a family where their parents have done okay, where they have the opportunity to go to a great school surrounded by great people in this amazing community, um, they now have uh, a duty they have to do to others in our community and others in the country who aren't so fortunate. And so they need to understand all sides of that as they grow up and, and, and kind of face the world. As I was thinking this morning about where this conversation might go, I was reminded of some words of William Faulkner at the end of his last novel, The Reavers. There's a scene where a young boy has gotten into trouble and he's crying. And the patriarch of the family, his grandfather, shows up and he's begging forgiveness of his grandfather. And he's asking, he asks him, how can I, how can I forget what I've done? And he asks his grandfather, tell me how to forget. And the grandfather says, you can't. Nothing is ever forgotten. Nothing is ever lost. It's too valuable. And the boy says, then what can I do? And the grandfather says, live with it. Live with it, the boy says. You mean forever? For the rest of my life? Never to get rid of it? Never? I can't. Don't you see? I can't. And the grandfather says, yes, you can. You will. A gentleman always does. A gentleman can live through anything. He faces anything. A gentleman accepts the responsibility of his actions and bears the burden of their consequences, even when he himself did not instigate them, but only acquiesced to them, didn't say no, though he knew he should. And I think that's where a lot of white America finds itself. That, w that we have been, that our forefathers acquiesced to an injustice that cannot be forgotten, nor can it completely define us. And we were talking earlier 
The words that Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, Dr. King said, those words are a promissory note. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, look, it, it, is, it is very difficult, whether in our personal lives or as we think about ourselves as a collective in a country, to look back at things that we're not very proud of. Um, but to kind of hide from those things, to shy away from them, to deny them will do us a disservice as we go forward. And so I think as we all kind of collectively raise our children, it's important for them to understand, you know, how those things happen, the lasting impacts of those things, and then charge the future to do the work that's needed to change them. I mean, when I think about what I want to leave my kids with, you know, very, very simply, I, I think um, there's kind of two main kind of tenets, if you will. I think the first is I want them to live a life where they feel complete, where they've given more than they've received, and where that by the time, you know, they move on and pass away and they stare at their God and have that kind of conversation, I want them to be able to say to God, as I hope to be able to say to God, I did everything I could with everything you gave me. That's one. And then I hope that in doing that, they're able to kind of look past weaknesses and mistakes with people and in their own way, find a way to kind of lead with love and let that be the, the, the kind of true north that they use to figure out their path into whatever they do. Let me say by way of conclusion that that which you give your children every day, you've given us a little helping of just now. And when any of us lead with love, then others will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.